Well, as you know, there's a lot of misinformation in the world and a lot of, ah, if I'm being beneficent, and I rarely am, um, twisting of the truth. And then there's, of course, just some outright lies. And that's one reason that this is, I think, an important series when we're looking at what we believe and, and why do we believe it. How can we explain the faith that we have? And uh, this has sort of become John 8, 31 through 32, has sort of become our key verse, if you will, our theme verse. But when Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's great freedom in knowing what the truth is and obeying it, applying it. You can know the truth and not apply it, and then you're going to be miserable, and that's kind of a foolish proposition. So words matter. God's word matters. And those of you who are really into grammar and spelling and punctuation, um, as Christians, it's important. The grammar is one thing. You know, you lose credibility if you're not using proper English, really even in today's day and age. And uh, so how can we be more effective communicators? Now look, I'm not singling out any individual. I make mistakes myself with grammar and, and pronunciation. So I'm just as guilty as anyone else. But you guys are all smart. You really are. And so our, what we say and how we say it is a reflection of that. And you may be super intelligent inside, but your mouth kind of <laughs> this row is going to be problematic, isn't it? I don't know why. All right, so here's some tweets here. Again, spelling matters. Almost done getting dressed, then deaf or definitely eating a bowel of cereal. <laughs> now, D-E-F-F, -F, if you're going to abbreviate definitely, it only has one F, but that's, you know. Um, bowel of cereal. Now, maybe this tweet is related to this individual. This person said, your colon smells great. <laughs> Don't know how you can know that. I think they meant cologne. This is from Serena Williams. I'm so bored. What am I to do tonight? So bored, ugh. What's the problem with that? Yeah, well then go to Home Depot and get some lumber. I mean, if you're really bored. There's no I in happiness. Well, not if you spell it that way. I ran into a glass door and I think I might have a Caucasian. You might. <laughs> Don't know what you might have. So then we have words that get mispronounced. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How do some people mispronounce this? They put an H on the end. Height. There's no H. I think they get it because of depth, width, breadth, height. But this is, look, English is a mess. We all know that, right? We can acknowledge it. It's a tricky, tricky language. And if, you're, if English is not your first language, you, yeah, it gets a little crazy. This is my zip code. Similar, similarly, there's my phone number. You can call me anytime you want, and you do. Uh, <laughs> no, which is awesome. But people will say like 98101 or 206 That's not correct. Do you see any O's in there? No, there's zeros, so it's 206-660. Drives me bats. I know, I have a, I could open a, a whole safari with all my pet peeves, because an entire wildlife kingdom. Um, yeah, there's no S, ladies and gentlemen, on any way, but anyways. Uh, <laughs> This one I used to screw up on, across. I went across the street. What do people say? Across. 
Sh -sh what, what? You feel called out. I, look, I, <laughs> she's like, there's not one I don't screw up on yet. Well, anyways. Uh, some people say supposedly. Now, in a survey done in May, this was the number two most irritating word that people thought that was misused, but it's supposedly, not supposedly. Um, Oh, this is a tough one, but how many, come on, be, be honest, how many of you say library? Okay, thank you, we've got an honest person here, library, and more difficult, I have a hard time saying, February, 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 that's a tough one, it's a, it's a tongue twister. Um, a lot of people say pitcher, well if you're talking about a pitcher, fine, but this is a picture, Different thing. Look, we could put all sorts of goofiness on here. Redundant. I love redundant words a lot. I really. <laughs> an actual fact. <clears throat> no, it's just a fact, or it's actual, but don't need the actual. A lot of people say this ATM machine. Why is that redundant? <laughs> Automatic teller machine. Machine. Similarly, the personal identification number number. <laughs> Put in your PIN number. Okay. Val, are you liking this? Val loves, Val loves English. He's very, you know, advanced planning. <laughs> well, we don't do a lot of, you know, well, I'm going to plan to do that yesterday. And etc. cetera. Do you know what et cetera means in the Latin? Well, et means and, <laughs> and cetera means, and so forth, or and the rest, kind of like Gilligan's Island, the first season when they didn't have the professor and Marianne and, and the rest. Um, so yeah, so it, it, the other problem with et cetera, one is some people say et cetera, it's like, no, it's E-T-C, abbreviation, et cetera. And then et cetera, because it means and the rest and so forth, is it's supposed to have a list of things. So you can't have a list of one or none. Uh, I, went up to, I went to the store to pick up milk, etc. No, not really. Milk, cheese, butter, eggs, etc. Then you can do that. Does that make sense? You're learning so much. I, oh, I came to church as a visitor and I'm learning English. Gross. And it's summer on top of that. Closed fist. I don't know what other kind of fist you'd have. Whoa, that's called a high five, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, oh, I, I was redundant here and put, oh no, there we go. Uh, tuna fish. Oh. Tuna is a fish. We don't say salmon fish, goldfish fish. There's no such thing as a tuna fish. It's just tuna. With inflation, threena or forna. Repeat again. <laughs> okay. We have some, uh, in a couple of songs, when it, uh, it talks about Jesus rising again. Well, he only rose once, but, you know, whatever. It's just theology. A.M. in the morning. Hey, I'll meet you at 8 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> again, you need to know the Latin. Uh, A.M. Who are the nerds that know the Latin? Mike? It's uh, anti-meridium, with an M, not an N. And of course, PM is post-meridium, meaning before noon, afternoon. So you don't need to say in the morning, just AM, 10 AM, or 10 in the morning, that's fine. Uh, past history, <laughs> postpone until later. I was gonna postpone that until yesterday. Uh, improper usage. Uh, I caught myself the other day with, with Val. When somebody asks you, uh, how are you doing, and you say, I am good, or no, I'm doing good, that's not correct, because when you say, I'm doing good, it means you're doing charity work. It's not a description of, of how you feel, so you're saying, I'm doing well. Thank, thank you for asking, Julie, I appreciate your concern. Uh, this one drives me bats. I do this with Anna all the time. These ones or those ones. No, it's just these or those. 
Well, those ones, okay? Those books, not those ones. Does that make sense? Two, 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 you guys know that. Your, your, those are all fun. There, there, there. This is why English is evil and horrible. Now here we have some more mangling. Um, and public speaking, and I just said, uh, well guess what? The first one, uh and um. Any uh, ummers in here, a few? Yeah. It's, it's filler speech, and it's, if you're listening to it, it becomes super annoying. And plus, you're wasting your breath, you know? Save, save the environment. <laughs> and yet, I've seen two press secretaries for the President of the United States, I won't mention their names, uh and um, and these are professional speakers, and they say uh and um all the time. Uh, uh. I was quoting there. Just. Oh, Christians of the world, stop saying just, just, just. I was thinking about that the other day, and it was actually on Zoom, and I realized in my prayer I had, why do we say that? It's filler words, and it actually is kind of demeaning to, you know, when you say just this, you know, Lord, would you just make my husband a better man? First of all, that ain't going to happen. Ooh, I threw in an ain't in there for you. But uh, dump the just. We don't need it. God doesn't need it. This is a real common one. People say, um, you know, well, I want to err on the side of doing the right thing. No, you want to err on the side. Error is a mistake. Saying error is a mistake. <laughs> and I'm flying through these. <laughs> The, there's two beautiful words. They're, they're not even cousins. <laughs> and the reason these two are super important is because when we look at Scripture, God does use those words, but never together. Like, literally, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross for your sins. Like means... Yeah, it's similar to something. Um, Mike looks like Brad Pitt. <laughs> He's not Brad Pitt. He doesn't literally look like Brad Pitt. But whew, Diana gets, gets him confused all the time. She literally gets them confused. Like literally. The, now, literally means exactly, precisely, okay? And so if you say like literally, even, even, even God weeps when you say that. He, he, he like literally weeps. Uh, literally, the reason I think that's a pet peeve for me is because when we look, when we look at interpreting scripture, we want to look at, at, look at it beginning with a literal interpretation, a literal view. God says what he means, and he says it precisely. Now, context and other items can give us some clues as to when God is talking figuratively or being more symbolic or allegorical or anything like that, like that, uh, but like literally. So let me give you an example of where the word like we have a like in here, and we have literal stuff, too. Isaiah 40, starting verse 28. Tell me what's literal and what's figurative. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? Sounds pretty literal to me. So God is telling us through Isaiah, this is who God is. He does not faint or grow weary. Now, are we being literal there? We're being a little figurative because God doesn't get, but he's using terms that we would understand. God doesn't get tired. We get tired. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. He's being literal about human beings. And here, he, here we get a like. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. So that's not literal. It is figurative. And that's where like is a great word. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How cool is that, that we have that all in that same thing? I don't know why I have that up there, because I'm being redundant. 
oh, couldn't care less. I could care less. It's I couldn't care less. Just trust me on that. It's like, you could care less? Really? No, you couldn't. Uh, there's no such word as irregardless. It doesn't exist. I think people get confused with irrespective, maybe, but it's just regardless. I R, ear, when you put it in the front of the word, what does it do? It means not. So when you say it's irregardless, you're saying it's without, not without regard, or I'm even confusing myself. Don't use it, it's not a real word. Double negatives in general, we'll get into that more some other day. Would, should, could, of, versus have. Is it supposed to be would of or would have? Would have, you're correct. Same thing with should have, could have, not could have, would have. The other one that drives me nuts, I want to have it on here, is when people say, well, then that, then they're, they're recounting maybe conversation. Uh, and then Ken goes, no, he didn't goes, he said. Anybody do that? Never mind. Oh, you're pointing to people, friends, next, wow, that's, make room for the bus, my goodness, hop on kids. No, we're not even gonna get into punctuation today, but <laughs> punctuation matters, especially to grandpa. So why do these things matter at all? Because you may have seen this, this is from Gallup. Uh, they've been do, pull, doing polling for many, many years. This is from May of this year, and what they found, and I, that chart to me is a little bit confusing there, but the red line, see the 20 on the right-hand side? That is the percentage of those they surveyed that believe that the Bible is the actual word of God and to be taken literally. That is the lowest it's ever been since they started polling, 20%. Then you have a chunk there of 49% that believe that the Bible is inspired by God, but not to be taken literally. So when it says, thou shalt not murder, eh, it doesn't say thou shalt not like murder, literally. Uh, and, and don't use the word literally, literally, by the way, when you don't need to use the word literally. Just state what you have, say what you have to say. You don't need to put it there. If you're speaking literally, you don't have to say you're speaking literally, unless the person says, are you speaking literally or figuratively? And then, like, punch them in the literal face. <laughs> and then 29% said that the Bible is full of fables, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. Now you guys know this first, we will memorize this one. 2 Timothy 5, 16 to 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Check that out, for training in righteousness. So we know what is the right thing to do. We have a world that has no idea what the right thing is. So we can, we first start with our own lives and you know, it's leading by example that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And if you're not sure how to live life, then maybe spending more time in the Bible would be helpful. Now the Bible is a fascinating book. It's really not a book, it's a collection of books. You guys know that. It's around, as you can see here, 611,000 words long in its original languages. So that's why I brought these books. And yes, I am a nerd, so I had all of these. So Moby Dick, have you ever read Moby Dick? It, it's a long book, but the Bible is three times longer. And then of course we have uh, The Lord of the Rings, which Valerie is reading them. Have, have you gone through all of them yet? Oh, just about done, okay. So there you go, there's The Lord of the Rings, and those are some pretty, you know. Um, 455,125 words. And Val has read 422,000, give or take, literally. Who in here has been nerdy enough to read War and Peace? Well, wow, there's a, that's a very small club. Although you could use this as a club, because this is one, one heavy. War and Peace, it's only, uh, what, a little over half a million words, no bigs there. But still, doesn't compare to the Bible. 
So there are a lot of words in Scripture, but this is, this is why we need to study it. This is why we need to, you know, is God just, is this some cosmic joke? Or is it real? You know, is he serious about this? And it matters because of, well, that verse we just looked at, um, training in righteousness. One more object lesson. I know, this just shows my full nerdum. So there's R2-D2 in Lego form. I mean, his little antenna comes out and his head, yeah, he's, no, I don't play with him. Um, not really good for cuddling, I can say. This guy here, any guess on how many pieces, how many Lego bricks comprise this little old guy? Oh, well, got a little low and a little high. So uh, 2,314 little Lego pieces. Now, they come in bags, they separate them up. Have you ever put together a big Lego thing? I know Carlene's grandkids have. <laughs> um, here, if I wanna know how to put this thing together and make it look like that, th this is a pretty hefty instruction manual. Thankfully, it's, it's got pictures telling you where to put everything. Um, but you know what, that's what the Bible is. I need this to know how to get that. Just like we need God's word in order to be what he wants us to be, to be the men and women that he's called us to be. There's not a single person in this room that doesn't have worth and doesn't have value. And there's not a single person in this room that, where in eternity past, God didn't come up with a perfect plan for your life, what he wants you to do. Look, sin is in the world, evil is in the world, and we battle that constantly. So the things that aren't going the way you would like them to, you know, in, in your life, that's because of, of sin. We have a sin nature, it wants to do its own thing, it wants to reject God. But God's law, well, you know what? Psalm 19 says it better. Verse 7, God, the law of the Lord is perfect. How many of you love all of God's law? How many of us should love all of God's law? <laughs> okay. And every time we sin, we're really hating God's law. It's like, eh, either we don't take it seriously enough, or have you ever knowingly sinned and you knew the consequence, but you did it anyway. Um, anyone do? Okay. Only two people in here. Hmm. All right. <laughs> but why do, why do we do that? Why do we do something knowing full well what the consequence is going to be and knowing that the consequence is going to be unpleasant? Any suggestions? Why do we do that, Nicole? Selfishness. Selfishness. What else? We're stupid, thank you. I, both Mike said that in unison, whoa. That's kind of freaky. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're selfish, we are st foolish and stupid. Um, arrogant, yeah. You know, and, and, and we're, we're, we are temporal beings, so we tend to live for the now. And so it's like, I'm going to take momentary pleasure now at the risk of losing long-term benefit. And I'm willing to take the risk. Ah. The law of the Lord is perfect. Look what it does. This is awesome. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. <laughs> the precepts of the Lord are right, <clears throat> rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great re reward. Do we all believe that? Yeah, I think intellectually we do. Uh, I mean, all those promises, you could argue that this is David, by the way, that is, he's uh, 
listed as the author of this particular psalm, the human author that God used. And one could argue he's being a bit redundant because he uses some very similar words. But you want to get redundant? Let's get redundant again. You're welcome. So if you hear me say anything incorrectly from a grammatical standpoint, or I'm doing it on purpose as an object lesson. <laughs> like some of you don't believe that literally. <laughs> kind of hurt. I think we should get church t-shirts that just say maybe like on one side and literally on the other. Huh? And then I could literally talk behind your back. <laughs> Psalm 119. What's unique about Psalm 119? It's really long. <laughs> it's the longest psalm uh, of the psalms, and it's the longest chapter, if you will, in Scripture. Can't really nail down when it was written. The psalms, do you know that this, the book of Psalms was, was compiled over a millennia? I mean, a span of a thousand years. How great is that? Um, we've got Moses writing Psalm 90, and of course David, Asaph, there's a lot of different authors. David is the one who gets credit for writing most of them. Um, some think that Psalm 119 might have been written by Ezra or even Daniel. The time frame, you look at what's going on in there. But the theme of Psalm 119, you just see worship, and you see the attributes of God. The word Yahweh, <clears throat> which in most English Bibles is in all caps, capital L-O-R-D, is uh, used 24 times in Psalm 119. Well, what other theme do we have in Psalm 119? Yeah, this is why I, I tend to think that David wrote Psalm 119 and that's why I read part of Psalm 19, because the language is very similar. It's, say it with me, like literally the same thing. <laughs> you see these words, law, testimonies, ways, promises, or promise, words, statutes, commandments, ordinances, rules, decrees, precepts. They're very similar words, so it's, it's like Mr. Thesaurus just dumped right, that doesn't sound right, but shared his vocabulary. But guess what we find out about God in Psalm 119? And guess what? We're going to go through the whole psalm. Not today, because we'd be here until 3. And I don't know about you, but I am hungry right now. It's very nice to see you again. What are you going to have for lunch? Are they going to take you out somewhere? Your sister. Pizza! What time do you want me to come over? All right, sweet. <laughs> but we learn um, at least eight things about God and his attributes. And the, those are the verses in Psalm 119 in parentheses. We learn that he is righteous. Why is it important that God is righteous? Anyone? We, yeah, we know we could trust him, right? What else? Why, why is it important? Can I repeat that? If he's not right, we're screwed, is what he said. A hardware term, I'm sure. Marty? If he's not righteous, then his entire character just Yeah, we're doomed. If we can't trust God to always do right and be right, that's problematic. Then we are hoped, hopeless. <laughs> My thesaurus was going there. But he is righteous. He is trustworthy. We can tie that in with him being righteous. He's truthful. It is hard to trust anyone in this world. Right? We can't trust anyone. Even people we used to be able to trust. That's kind of a... When Reagan was talking about young people, and because you guys are facing things that I never faced in life. I never even envisioned. That's, that's why you hear older folks, I mean, I'm not an older folk. 
Apparently I'm married to Anna because the one usher we've said, oh, well, your wife dropped that pen. It's like, <laughs> where, where is she? I've been looking forever. But yeah, I mean, I, you want to know how to survive this crazy world? We've got to know God's word. You want to live rightly? We have a God we can trust. It's not always comfortable, but my goodness, some of the stuff that our current generation is facing is it's just unbelievable. And they're getting at it from all angles. And who just glories in that? Satan does, because he wants to destroy the next generation. So if he can convince our current generation and future generations and even past generations, if he can convince us that we're not worthy, that we're not loved, that our life really doesn't mean anything. Look, if he can get us to be hopeless, how long does it take for him to win? How long does he need us to be hopeless? For one second. And then people make really horrible decisions. So we need to make sure that we're giving ourselves hope by reading his word, and that we're sharing hope by proclaiming his word. He is truthful. His word is truthful. That is, it's such a simple thing, and yet it's so important. It means when we read his word, we can trust everything that is in there. Now, it doesn't mean we understand everything. That's okay. We're always going to have questions. It's like, okay, God, I know you're truthful. I know you're loving. You're always going to do what's best for me. But what were you talking about in that verse? How does it apply to me? What is it, how should my life change to line up with that? By the way, I forgot to mention this. I will email these eight things out with the verses tomorrow. So uh, I should have said that before you guys started taking notes. But God is faithful. Oh, that just gives us so much comfort and, and courage and contentment. He's unchangeable. I love the fancy pants word for that. He's immutable. He doesn't change. He's eternal. Well, that's pretty good because we are going to live forever, um, either with him or without him. Heaven or hell is the alternative. So it would be nice if God were there with us. And he will be. He is light. So when our world seems a little dark and dim and confusing, we know that he can illuminate uh, he can give us the truth, show us the truth. That's what part of the job of his Holy Spirit. And he is pure. So obviously today we're not going to go through all of Psalm 119, but I do want to start with it. And if you recall, Psalm 119 is one of about a dozen acrostics or kind of a poem, if you will, in Scripture. And Psalm 119 is unique in that it goes through the entire Hebrew alphabet. So we've got 22 groups of eight verses each. And in the Hebrew, each of those eight verses begins with the same letter. In the English, it doesn't do that. Um, so Aleph is the first Hebrew letter, so it's kind of our letter A, if you will. Yeah, even printing double-sided, it's, yeah, it's six pages, so that's a lot of scripture. So let's just dive into it a little bit here. Aleph, blessed are those, and if you want to say blessed, that's okay. Either works. If I say blessed, I feel like I should say blessed. No? All right, thank you. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. And, and start mentally keeping track of those, that list of words we looked at. Uh, that list, where was that, right? That list right there. See how many times those bad boys pop up. Especially in the second letter, Beth. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the... Law of the Lord, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. 
You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is a cool passage. You, you know, think of what God wants for us. What he doesn't do, I mean, it would be like dumping all 2,314 Lego bricks in your lap and saying, okay, now put it together. And not having a picture, not knowing what he wanted, he doesn't do that. We get, this isn't the Bible, but he gives us instructions. Sometimes I wish he'd give pictures, but you know, he actually does. He does that too. Think of all of the symbolism that we have in Scripture. God gives us people to encourage us and to guide us. If I can give one piece of advice, I'll give more than one piece of advice to young people, is listen to older, wiser individuals. Something happens about the time of puberty where you just think that your parents know nothing, right? Here's the stage, stages of life. When you're little, your parents can do no wrong and they're so smart. I think I remember asking my dad, I was like, do you know everything? And he said, yes, I do. <laughs> and mom almost got a cramp in her neck from shaking her head, no. So when you're a kid, you think mom and dad know everything, right? When you get to Julie's age and Lydia's. No, Lydia, you're not there yet? No, okay. Uh, then you think they know nothing. Oh, they're so dumb. I can't believe my parents. And then you get a little bit older and what happens? You realize how much they really knew. Unless your parents were a box of rocks. And you may have had those, and that's okay. But guess what? What a stupid thing to say, isn't it? Guess what, Mike? <laughs> Go ahead, guess. What? <laughs> we have a heavenly father who does know everything. And he has said, I'll tell you everything you need to know. All you have to do is ask. And then apply it. Just actually do it. Live it out. Hmm. Oh, the word rules can also be translated decrees, if you want to throw in another word there. So let's take a look at the second letter, Beth. These are verses that you guys probably know. And David is asking a really good question. And when you see these masculine pronouns, um, David is not identifying as a male at this point. Um, these are generic. So it's male, female. How can a young person, man, keep his way pure? How cool. Great question. How do I keep from messing up? By guarding it according to your word, or some translations say by hiding it, right? By trusting in it. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So if you need some scripture reading to do this week, those first 16 verses are really awesome. And they'll teach you a lot about who God is and, and give you, well, a hint of what's to come in Psalm 119. And it's very humbling to me that God loves us so much that he gave us his word. He could have just let us wander around but God doesn't leave us alone. God gives us his word. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And we can ask God for wisdom. You guys know that verse in James chapter 1 about 
You know, if you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you liberally or generously and without reproach. And in other words, there are no dumb questions when you talk to God. Ask him. Keep asking until, not until you get the answer you want, but until you get the answer you need. And then if, that does, if that's confusing, then talk to Christians that are older, not necessarily in age, but have a spiritual maturity that you recognize, and ask them that question, ask them what they think about that. Old people like to be asked questions. Old people like to talk. Some old people like to talk. Some peop old people you can't get to talk. Um, but how great is that? I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So the word matters. God's word matters. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, for just everything we gain from it. What do we have to lose from reading scripture? Nothing at all. It's it's there for us. These, there's simple truths, and then there's things that maybe are a little more complex. But, Lord, we, just, we thank you for your Holy Spirit and that he reveals truth to us. Give us wisdom in applying your truth, your word to our lives. And when we mess up, when we sin, help us to remember that your love is the same. You will never give up on us. You will never forsake us. Everything that we need, Lord, you have provided and will provide. You give us grace for each moment of our lives. And our goal is to obey you, to follow you, and to bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, thank you for our time today. Be with this congregation. Be with everyone here today that they would be blessed by hearing from your word, that they would be encouraged and be reminded of how much worth they have because of the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.